Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. Let's let's see there if we can make this work. Yeah. Okay. So what? what is just give you an idea of what the last year has been like, how we've gotten to where we are today, what it's looking like to the year, and then, um, as Jean had had mentioned, go into some of the things that we've done in what we call creation care, uh, not only uh, to benefit the the uh, to benefit God's creation, but also uh, to uh, use it as a way to teach others, especially kids, but also adult guests as well, that um, <clears throat> this is what in, uh, in the Christian faith, that we are charged uh, with being stewards of what God has entrusted to us. So um, I'll just, I'll go through and uh, we saw on the agenda, uh, we have a Q&A at the end. Um, so I don't mind if you, if you, if you want to just break in, that's fine. Well, we can okay. do a Q&A at the end, so. Okay, so here. So um, I, I like to start with this picture because <laughs> doesn't this weird? A bunch of people all close together without masks. <laughs> I mean, yeah. this is what camp used to be like, and uh, you know, up until a little over a year ago, mm -hmm. this is how most of us would experience life. We love to be with people. We love to be without. But of course, last March it was actually March 16th, the day before St. Patty's. Uh, Governor Hogan of Maryland uh, decided that they, we needed to shut down to, to try to, and, and good thing because it was, you know, the day before all the young people were going to go. Um, and uh, so we were actually shut down from March 9th to early. And um, based on that period, we, we couldn't serve food. We couldn't have guests. Mm. We, we were thinking we might be able to run summer camp, but uh, we did so much work to try to make it work. We canceled June, but we were thinking we could survive. But uh, our assessment as of early June was it was likely that we were not going to be able to state campers. And about half of our campers are from Delaware. So we decided it was too risky with, with summer camp at that point. And, and we, uh, we just canceled the summer. Actually, it turned out that uh, in mid-June, Governor Hogan did say that out-of-state not permitted and I'm stopping here. My connection's on. Doing okay? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so uh, we did. We we couldn't run summer camp, and th that was, you know, uh, it was for everyone involved, for us, uh, for our campers, for our families. Uh, but it, we think it was the right decision. Uh, mm -hmm. We did uh, decide to put together a court for the summer anyway. Uh, and it, uh, it, we came up with together apart, deep down in our hearts. And Pastor Chris will know that uh, deep down in our heart is a saying uh, that camp people at Pocomath, uh share all the time. Pocomath is in our hearts. And so we wanted to have a way for people to rem be reminded that no matter what, we're for you and we'll be ready to serve you when we can. Um, after we opened on Jul July, um, you know, things were different. But we were able to do some things, uh, even in the midst of that, you know, very terrible or early part of the pandemic. Uh, this is a an Eagle Scout pony in our outdoor chapel. Um, everybody was masked and it was outside. We were able to run local pastor licensing school, and normally this would uh, take place in the dining room, but instead uh, we re converted our dining room to a, a combination and eating space. Everybody had their own table six feet apart. Uh, mm -hmm. Everybody wore masks and the speakers, uh, and uh, we just, you know, we we did our best to um, do what we thought were the best practices based on the science, uh, but a, programming to continue. Uh, we changed our food service so that instead of buffet cafeteria style, so we had our our staff on one side of the buffet serving uh, people. Uh, touch their silverware; they didn't touch any serving dishes. You you, you know the role, right? This is this is went, uh, especially early in the pandemic, uh, we created outdoor dining spaces so people who mm -hmm. didn't feel comfortable dining indoors could, uh, you know, take their plate and go outdoors. There weren't that many people who were coming, uh, but, you know, our, our staff, they're amazing. They do wonderful things. And, and so they individually packaged uh, for people so they felt safer. And my favorite part of this is it says tamper evidence uh, they even sealed it up so you knew that people weren't tampering with it and <laughs> writing code. This is, you, you do your best to manage your way through a pandemic. 
that's what we did. Uh, and we came up with different types of online programs, did online retreats. Uh, we did a parenting through pandemics uh, group where uh, several weeks where parents came together uh, on a Sunday evening and they had facilities to help give them support about, you know, I mean, you know how hard it has been for parents at home mm -hmm. uh, trying to do work. Uh, and, and we know it's taken an especially on women, especially uh, in the workforce, more women have had to um, <clears throat> leave because they've been forced to choose uh, educating their children over uh, living. So uh, these are all things we did. One of the things I'm proudest of is in the fall, we uh, an interactive trail walk. We normally do a bonfire and hayride, and we just didn't feel like that. So um, our staff put together this walk through the woods lit there were skulls there were pirates there were <laughs> shipwrecks there were dinosaur eggs and uh you know families could come uh it was outdoors uh some to wear masks when uh but they we, they did have a picture station so they could take their masks off for the picture station we had over 100 people uh we opened our uh, in the summer we opened our waterfront uh for canoeing and kayaking we opened our swimming pool we only allowed 30 people on the pool at a time uh, we, we, we tried to do what we can to serve people and help them to at least uh, some respite in the midst of the pandemic. And mm -hmm. in that, we uh, were able to serve people uh, over the course of the summer and, as I said, this additional 100 uh, in the fall. We continued to uh, serve people. Um, as you know, things were, have been challenging for businesses such as ours. Essentially, we're in the hospital business. And you know, anything related to travel, hotel, uh, food service, and pummeled. Uh, we, we lost uh, between uh, April 1 of 2019 and March 31st of 2020, we lost over 1 point, almost 1.2 million income, oh. um, uh, almost a half million dollars in summer camp income, and over $700 in uh, retreat income. Fortunately, we reduced expenses, government grants, and um, most notably, uh, I see my internet unstable, I'm gonna wait. Mm -hmm. Most notably, uh, our donor uh, provided a half million dollars in unrestricted contributions in that oh, period. Wow. Um, so God has provided for uh, this ministry. And in that, we had a very specific focus. Um, we wanted to uh, keep our core Intact. So believe it or not, we've had, we have 13 year round staff, including our um, retreat staff, our, our camp staff, two housekeepers, two food service, our maintenance staff. We were able to, we've been able to keep our 13 year round staff role um, oh, wow. throughout the entire, uh, you know, last year. And I just feel that we're really blessed for that because not only are, are we ready to ramp up that, um, you know, occurs, but also we didn't have to impact their law um, by letting them go. And that, uh, mm -hmm. I know of a lot of camps that had to do that and I understand a decision they had to make, but we did, uh, we, you know, we felt that um, God would honor if we uh, tried to figure it out. And um, I have to tell you, we are as strong as ever financially uh, going into this summer. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we, we need to give thanks to God for that. And through this whole time, you know, we, we did not want to uh, have people feel uncomfortable uh, at Pocomath in any way. So, uh, you know, we followed all the CDC guidelines. Uh, we require masks indoors. Uh, we have reduced capacities, um, you know, cleanses, uh, food service, all of that. Uh, but in the end, uh, we're only going to serve those who served, and those numbers have been way down. Uh, we, okay. believe, we believe that's going to change. As the summer continues and the, the fall, we will uh, start to see activity closer to what we would consider normal. Mm -hmm. What we're excited about is we are in the midst of planning for summer camp. Uh, and uh, what we've done is we have the capacity for this year because uh, we are following uh, CDC and Camp Association guidelines, which call for what's called cohort camping. So of normally, you know, we have kids come in, they're in a cabin, they go through the day and they're with uh, other in the day. And at night they're, mm -hmm. you know, we got a hundred kids together and Pastor Chris knows we do time and we're all jumping around and yelling and screaming and having fun. Uh, we, we can't 
next year. Uh, so when kids come in, they'll be in a cohort, in a cabin of approximately eight campers and two staff, and they will stay in that cohort, what we're calling a pod, the week mm -hmm. and we'll have little to no contact with other pods. If they come, if we do gatherings, everybody's going to be in masks and their pods will still uh, remain kind of intact mm -hmm. and, and distanced from the others. And, and, you know, it's just, you know, the campers are not going to be vaccinated. Uh, they're, the, the data is not going to be allow many mm -hmm. uh, campers under 16 to be vaccinated, if any, prior to Summer. And so we have to follow these guidelines uh, to uh, run camp as safe as possible. And we reduce capacity because we know that there are going to be families who just are not willing to, to send their child to right. camp at this point. Uh, so instead of, you know, about a, a capacity, we're, we're uh, scheduled to have 500 capacity. The good news is about 300 campers registered already. So uh, oh, wow. there, are, there are parents... <laughs> You know, maybe despite their reservations, they just feel like they need a break and they're going to send their kids. Um, I will say we need your help. We need we need young adults to uh, and we're finding that it's as hard as ever to hire them. Uh, any, mm -hmm. Anybody who graduated from high school or older, if you know of young adults who uh, want to make a difference in the life of a person, plus have the experience of a life, uh, a lifetime. Pastor Chris was one of those. Uh, it it. Um, it's a great experience. They, they will remember it for, we pay them to do it. Uh, and we are, we are hoping to get as many of our uh, vaccinated as possible. And that will uh, allow us to continue. Even if we have, for example, uh, you know, one of the cohorts there, there, there are symptoms or there have positive case that may affect part of the camp, uh, but would not uh, require us to shut the camp down. So mm -hmm. it's, um, you know, uh, this is a life pandemic, and uh, you know we we realize that it's probably going to be the end of this year before we see anything like normal activity. We also uh, know that um, emotionally, spiritually, it's going to take a while for people to recover from all of this. So mm -hmm. um, we're uh, my connection's unstable. Pausing again. We are prepared to uh, you know just work our way through this, uh, following God's leading and. Um, Trusting that God will lead us and will provide and will enable us to do uh, important in ministry. So that's the update mm -hmm. for camp. Um, now I want to give you a brief overview of some of the things that we've done over uh, the past, uh, I'm going to say decade, because uh, the first thing I'll start with is the, um, uh, uh, the Riverview Retreat Center, as mm -hmm. Chris mentioned. It's a 26 square foot facility that is um, in, uh, on the north side of the property. It has 24 hotel rooms, private uh, bathroom, you know, two queen beds in a room, has a nice dining room, meeting space. Uh, but when we built that, we wanted to actually looked at what's called LEED um, certification, which is an environmental uh, stamp of approval. Uh, but what we determined was that would probably cost us a quarter million dollars uh, and we could just work and not get certified. And so, uh, we uh, had installed a thermal heating and cooling system, so that that saves uh, approximately 30% uh, of the energy that it normally would require to uh, heat and cool the building. Uh, if you look at the siding on that picture, that looks kind of like wood siding, but that's all actually called a plank. And uh, hardy plank is a cement fiber siding, which is um, cement and sand. <laughs> it's considered a sustainable material, unlike vinyl siding is made of petroleum. Mm -hmm. it's, also, it's also a low maintenance material. It does not painting. It is, uh, the color is baked into the cement fiber. So uh, uh, also used, um, you know, low emitting paints and adhesive, ceramic tile, regional material, low impact and exterior lighting. So we wanted to use this uh, you know, this project as a model for how you can build sustainably. Um, just as importantly, uh, this is a map of the, um, uh, the property. I don't know if you can see, I'm gonna try to color this line right across here. So you see this line right across mm -hmm. the, the, uh, at the center of camp. It's more the third of camp, but this is the Chester River. We got about 4,000 feet of shoreline 
the river. And all of our buildings are in this area within this line, which a thousand feet of the water adjusted for elevation. So it, this is called the critical area line. And anything within the critical area line uh, is considered significant impact on the watershed. And uh, when, when we went to the direction of the retreat center, uh, what, what we realized was that there were 16 septic tanks within this critical area. All throughout all these buildings had septic mm -hmm. tanks. And that, those septic tanks put untreated um, effluent to those um, drain fields, which eventually went into the, uh, you know, into the river. So what that was doing, that was, that was putting a lot of nitrogen into the bed. And if you um, are, are familiar with how watersheds are protected, reducing nitrogen, reducing nutrients is really critical to um, protect the watershed. So uh, what we did when we built the retreat center, it actually added 1.1 million to the uh, cost of the project. But what we did was uh, we naturalized uh, all of our wastewater treatment. So we took all 17 of the tanks out of commission and instead, they uh, now pump all to a central center of camp. Uh, these, uh, you see these candy canes. Uh, mm -hmm. they, uh, this is what's called a train of large, large septic tank. And what happens is those, uh, the, the effluent goes in there, all the solids fall, fall out, go down to a tank near the end, near this building. And then they go through a trickling filter of little styrofoam balls and bacteria live on those styrofoam balls and as the water constantly re, uh, recirculated through those the styrofoam balls the bacteria actually nitrogen that's they live off the nitrogen and it and this system is very low low energy usage it reduces the nitrogen in the effluent by about five percent then the water is pumped into out in this field there's an acre uh, orchard grass field. Orchard grass is a, you know, a grass that feed to animals. Uh, there's a five acre orchard grass field and the, the remaining effluents had a connection unstable. I'm waiting. The remaining orchard grass, uh, the remaining effluent, which still has about 15% nitrogen, is pumped through drip irrigation into this orchard grass field and grass actually uptakes the nitrogen. It, it drinks the water and it uses the nitrogen as, as for its own growth. And so uh, the net result is uh, next to zero uh, nutrients put in to the groundwater that goes across the river. And we're really, really proud of that. We think yeah. that it is a, it's a significant increase in uh, you know, the, the watershed um, uh, health and it's our it's our contribution and we can teach kids about that we can teach them about the one thing you can do to mm -hmm. actually uh, take care of god's creation now the next thing we did uh about six years ago i think it was I, i'm losing but uh if you look at this upper picture this is our fellowship hall which is our traditional thing on uh the chester river and you can see that uh Back six years ago, prior to this project, the rock revetment that was this, uh, the, the erosion against erosion was right up against the building. Actually, what we were finding was the water was uh, breaching that revetment and starting to uh, erode the ground underneath the building. Th this is not unusual mm -hmm. for yeah. such a ours. So we, we partnered with the Chester River Association to create what's called a living shoreline. And so uh, they removed all of this revetment. They created what's called a sill. So it's a similar type of revetment, but it's about 30 feet out building. And then uh, brought in a, a bunch of sand and uh, uh, planted in uh, native grasses and native plants. And this grows into um, a natural filtration. So what happens is, uh, comes down you know part of our camp is 30 feet above ground so when runoff comes down into this area uh, first of all instead of eroding under the building it gets caught in this sand area uh, the nutrients that are in that area can uh, mm -hmm. uptake the the, 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 the the that area can uptake the nutrients it also creates uh, a natural habitat habitat for 
wildlife that uh, you know might happen to uh, be native to our area. That's amazing. That's just amazing. And then it's wonderful. Um, and what this still is a high tide, and and you know when boats come by, it, it breaks it wave action. You know it dissipates the energy, and sometimes the high tide will still go over and it will go into the into the wet you know this marshland wetland area, but um, all water it. So. Uh, we have been able, this is considered uh, one of the most innovative low impact ways to uh, prevent shoreline erosion. And it costs it cost dollars a foot. So it costs uh, $200,000. But in partnering with the Fair Association, we were able to get a grant from the Maryland Department of Environment and uh, uh, National Oceanic and Aeronautics Administration uh, to pay for the entire thing. So it not cost us a cent. And now whenever campers are down there, we can, we have a big sign, yeah. of all, you know, like a museum or state park sign. And they can see this is, you know, this is the, the care of the environment uh, without really doing a lot of damage to it. And so we're, we're very, very proud of this. Yeah. Um, last two things. So uh, in 2018, we brought online a 489 kilowatt solar array. Uh, Yay! Yeah, so <laughs> it provides nearly all of our energy, um, and uh, it's about a million dollars, but again, we didn't pay a cent for it uh, because Maryland has a program where uh, a third-party investor can pay for the project and will get uh, federal tax credits and also the state energy cap-and-trade credit. So, you know, there's a 40% federal credit credit. So the, the investor who bought this system got $400 off of her taxes or his taxes right off the bat, right? Um, and then for every uh, megawatt of energy it produces, there's another state energy credit that they get and they can sell on the open market mm -hmm. and trade credit. And um, in exchange, gave them a 25-year contract uh, to buy power at a below market rate. So 10 cents a kilowatt hour when our um, energy cost at the 12 and a half cents, 12.8 cents, I think it now, uh, hold on, unstable. Mm. Okay, I'm back. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we, uh, our rate now is 10.1 cents. It's, it will peak at 11 cents in year 25. And we feel very, very confident that it, it, we're still paying for our energy, but it's less than what we would pay if we were pay, buying it from Delmarva. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so far uh, we've saved uh, roughly 50, 20% a year that we've saved on our power. Uh, we did, like I said, we didn't pay a cent. Uh, the, uh, um, the, w the kids see it when they come down Booker's Wharf, they see this, it's right to their right, uh, looking out in the field. So again, mm -hmm. um, we didn't want to hide it. We wanted to make it prominent so that people right. uh, understood that uh, the things that we're doing. Uh, and then finally, um, we we were able to another partnership, another grant program. We uh, replaced nearly 1,200 fluorescent tubes, compact fluorescent bulbs, and incandescent bulbs with LED equivalents as P6 thermostats with programmable programmable thermostats across camp. And again, you know, they're just ways that you reduce your energy usage, um, you, you, you reduce your footprint, and um, it, it saves us money too. So that, uh, we, you know, we're, we're not happy with uh, saving money and uh, being uh, more responsible about uh, caring for God's creation. So uh, that is the short version. And I'm just going to ask if there's questions, and I'm going to stop sharing so we can see each other. <laughs> yeah, we can go back on video. Yeah. <laughs> I'm well, I don't, I don't have a question, but I, I just wanted to say that uh, all of your uh, creation care, as you call it, is really impressive. Very. Um, and, and the fact that the kids can see that that's um, caring for God's creation. You know, the solar panels and mm -hmm. everything, you know, that you've done. That yeah. So kids learning this at an early age it's you know it's just a wonderful thing and then you come to camp and see it yes yes it's not an abstract mm -hmm. concept um 
it's like, oh, look at this. I can look at this. I can touch mm -hmm. this. Yeah. So I, yeah. I think yeah. it's very, very impressive. Oh, very. Thank, thanks be to God. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, Jack, you said that your solar system savings, you broke up, you said that you had a certain amount of savings. Uh, yeah, it's about 15 to 20%. Um, <coughs> we, prior to, or, uh, prior to installing it, uh, after, after we had done the, the floor, uh, you know, the, the LED installation, <coughs> our, our annual energy bill was about $100,000. And uh, mm -hmm. it, it's been uh, somewhere between uh, 75 $85,000 the last couple of years. Actually, last year was $67,000 because yeah. we, had, we had buildings not being used. Uh, but uh, yeah, so, you know, we, uh, roughly $50,000 or so over the last, um, you know, three years. So, so you said that you have on, on your septic s system, you have a, a orchard grass is what you called it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a farmer. Uh, I did not know about orchard grass until we had to plant it. Okay. Mm -hmm. but it's <laughs> very hardy grass. Uh, and um, it, it, interestingly, the requires that we take it off property. So um, in theory, if we were to cut it, of it on the property, the nitrogen would go back into the ground. And so uh, what we do, um, th there's a local farmer who has animals and uh, he will come in and bail it uh, and take it off. Uh, he, he doesn't pay us um, and any cost in taking it off and he gets to feed his animals with it. How about that? Perfect. Yeah. Well, I, I just want to say, I'm not sure if any of you maybe other than Chris have ever been and stayed at the retreat center. Uh, it is absolutely a wonderful, wonderful place to stay. And when this pandemic is over, I think we should try to have a UMW retreat down there. Mm. That would be, that'd be a very interesting idea. Yeah, and, and kind of get a tour and see the different environmental things. Um, I'll, I'll make you a deal. If you come, I'll give you a hayride and, and okay. I'll, I'll narrate the tour myself. <laughs> I have a question. I love all your environmental things. To, um, I've never been to Potomac. Are your neighbors on the other side, both sides of the property or and around the property, are they environmentally conscious too? Um, uh, uh, although they're... Uh, Along Lands End Road, the road that runs along the river, um, there are mostly large properties. So the, the property to the south, 500 acres. Um, <clears throat> the property to the north of us, it's a 20 acres. It's just one house. You know, the, these mm -hmm. are these are people who have a lot of money. Um, <laughs> we we, I, I am not sure what they are doing or what they've done, uh, because we don't. Well, the one south of us never never comes <laughs> he lives in texas and he, lives and he has this beautiful million dollar state or something but or, well millions i think yeah. it's up for 15 million or something like that. Uh, so i can't answer that um stacy i guess uh, uh um, you know what we figure is that we have uh, a platform opportunity because we we have probably ten thousand people come through camp uh, mm -hmm. over the year between campers and and guests and uh, so by, by trying to make things as visible as possible, uh, we're, we're trying to use that platform. Okay, Stacy, well, this is one of our road trips. Hey, Jack. Yeah. Can you speak to the, um, the wonderful tradition of the uh, international um, folks coming and, and being a part of the summer program? I've always found yeah. that one of the most enriching things that... Uh, that I see um, when I come down for my little week each summer. Yeah, so typically um, we'll hire around 50 summer staff and about roughly 20% of those will be international staff. And over the years, we've had them from all over, from Europe, from Africa, from Asia, from Australia, New Zealand, South America. And <clears throat> what, what Chris is referring to is 
this experience that the campers get of um, you know, someone from another culture sharing about their culture. Tuesday night on uh, Camp Week is always international night. And so after we do our music mm -hmm. time, it's where we get all rowdy and have fun. Uh, the, the campers, uh, the, the staffers from uh, the other countries will share about their culture and will share, um, you know, how it's different than the United States. In fact, <laughs> I think I can share this probably safely in this crowd, but I remember the most recent one was in 2019 that I, I saw, and I think it was somebody from Scotland, and, and the campers get to ask questions, and, and they said, <laughs> one, says, one said, what's what do you find most unusual about uh, the United States? And he said that you can buy a gun in Walmart. So they get a, they get a perspective um, from people who are living differently in, in, in different ways. And, you mm -hmm. know, some of them are living in, in, in parts of the world. We, we had a guy from um, Tanzania that uh, he did not, he would not cash a paycheck all summer. Um, and, you know, back then they were making a hundred dollars a week. I think they make two sixty a week now. But you know, this, this they're not getting paid a whole lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, he would not cash it uh, and cash any of his checks, and he would go home and he could live a middle class existence for the rest of the year uh, in Tanzania um, mm -hmm. with that small amount of money, probably thousand mm -hmm. dollars that he made in, in the summer uh, at, at camp. And so, you know, when when people come and they share that with kids, kids get a sense for. Um, what, uh, you know, I guess what a privileged life we live and, yeah. and um, how, how <laughs> well, I don't think they really understand how many, how many resources we use compared to the rest of the world, but may maybe they'll get that when they're older. But uh, Chris, uh, you know, I don't know if you want to share anything else about. Yeah, I just want to say that this, um, this program has been going like that for um, a long, long time. When I was on staff at Pocomath, which is uh, yeah. some time ago, um, we had, you know, a third of the staff was internationals. And um, I, I'm still in contact with some of them. In fact, I was down two years ago, I, I, and it seems unreal that it was two years ago that that, that Tyrone was there, but uh, I think it was about that time. But uh, Tyrone Barrington is uh, one of the guys that I uh, served alongside uh, when I was on staff in the uh, late 80s or something like that. And um, he happened to be down there during the week that I was down there. Um, and it just was totally random, but, but boom, we ran into each other, it was just mm -hmm. a beautiful, uh, you know, reunion. Um, and um, it, it just is, I, that's why I wanted to have you say a few words, because it's just so incredibly enriching. And for the staff, um, for the kids, it's marvelous. They'll remember these uh, men and women for the rest of their lives, but for the staff too, they'll hold on to these relationships and, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and then for me to come back in, in, you know, from 2000 until now, uh, and, and I've, you, you all know, I've related Pacoma stories frequently in my sermons because they're very powerful um, yeah. experiences. And, you know, but I'm seeing kids of, of kid, you know, kids of, of staff members. I'm seeing kids of other of, of campers that were there when I was there. And it's just, uh, it's, it's an amazing thing. So, yeah, I think one of the things that, that I've come to realize over time is that when kids are exposed to international concepts and people it, it it affects them for the rest of their lives literally mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i mean it it's really makes a huge difference in their perspectives and many of our domestic we call them domestic staff but many of our um <clears throat> you know domestic staff um they they end up traveling because of that you know mm -hmm. they cool. uh, yeah. they go visit their friends um you know both of my daughters uh, went all over the world to visit their camp friends and um, my older daughter married, uh, you talk about life-changing, Chris, <laughs> my older daughter married, married a, a, a staffer from the UK. <laughs> so my son-in-law is from, uh, from England, you know, and so uh, it just, um, yeah, yeah, it does, as you say, Martha, it really does change perspective. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's, it's a great thing. Tyrone happened to be there uh, because uh, he became a successful businessman. He was from Jamaica, right, uh, Chris? Is it Jamaica? I'm just trying to remember. I, I, I kind of thought he was from London, honestly. Yeah. Oh, that's right. His family's from Jamaica, but he was from London. Yeah, um, okay. So, uh, but uh, we brought him in to speak to a leadership program because he had ended up becoming a really high profile entrepreneur in the fashion business. He was an agent for 
um, I guess he said he, according to him, he turned down Giselle as a because uh, he was wanting to get out as an as an agent. He now produces media and uh, uh, for the fashion industry, and it it just I wanted I wanted he wrote a book called um, God is My Agent, and he only takes ten percent. Uh, and uh, so I wanted to um, bring him in for a leadership program and just help kids to see that you know this you can be a Christian and you can be a business. And and you know allow mm -hmm. your faith to inform uh, how you do business in the world. Yeah, well, and because you know because he walks with God in in this life journey, he, he didn't change one bit from yeah. when I knew him as a staffer. He was the same mm -hmm. spirit of a human being, um, just using it in different ways. And I mean that's yeah. how how you see him in his little world is how he was on staff way way, way back when. And um, I think it's just a testament to what Jesus does in our hearts. You know. Mm -hmm. Jesus, this thing off by showing that t-shirt was it mary brown was that who was wearing that t-shirt the uh, together apart t-shirt i know but it looks kind of like her but it was actually um uh, one of our staffers one okay. of our staffers yeah but that deep down in my heart's thing that that's you know it's just the, the genetics of of Pekoma, and it's jesus christ that's, mm -hmm. that's you know that's sewing it all together and it's a beautiful thing mm -hmm. amen Jack, could you share a little bit with the ladies about the Galilean service? Sure. That was something that had such an incredible impact on my life like 62 years ago. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, uh, I still remember it like it was yesterday. So I will, let me, let me share this picture again. Um, <clears throat> So this, uh, this, this was not actually a Galilean service, but this is our outdoor chapel. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a um, uh, concrete amphitheater that sits right on the river with a cross. And this was actually an adult service. This was a church doing a, a similar to a Galilean mm -hmm. service. But on Thursday night of the camp week, uh, we have a service at dusk and the spiritual life coordinator. So Chris uh, would be that, you know, the week he's there. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll give a we'll give a message, um, you know, that kind of sums up the week. We'll invite them to consider accepting Jesus in their life. We'll invite them to uh, go deeper if they've already done that. We'll invite them to consider a uh, call to full time Christian service, um, and and we definitely put it that way. We don't think of uh, pastoral ministry as the only form of ministry. Right. I think people can serve God in many many ways, uh, and then they get a, pa a a candle and a foil pan. And uh, they get to light it with their cabin group and they go down and they put it on the water and those, uh, those candles uh, float out into the water. And, and by that time, it's even darker than this. And right. it, it is it's spectacular. It is, um, mm -hmm. it is the moment that most, most everybody remembers. As I go around the annual conference, uh, if yeah. somebody has, has been to camp, uh, the question I most often get asked is, do you still do the candles? And, uh, we do. This is our, by the way, this is our 75th anniversary. We were founded in 1946. And um, uh, they've been doing candles for as long as anybody can remember. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in the early days, we understood uh, they put candles on orange halves. And I guess it all just went into the river. Uh, now we use those foil pans and we retrieve them after the, after okay. the campers have gone away. Uh, it's amazing if, if you go out there with a flashlight, um, the foil pan <laughs> just pop and, and <laughs> you find, um, you know, we, we, we don't want to let them just float down the river and uh, trash up the river. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it is, uh, it is a, a spectacular moment. Mm -hmm. um, Chris, I still have a picture of you baptizing a, <clears throat> one of our campers. Uh, just before a Galilean service. Uh, and yeah, that was, that was a wonderful moment. We, we had oh to parents and make sure that the child had not actually been baptized. And, but she was, uh, she, she absolutely, her, she had given her heart and life to Christ and she wanted mm -hmm. to have that be the, the, you know, the defining moment there for the week. And uh, um, yeah, just, I, I don't think I've actually, Jack, I don't think I've related that particular story, um, but that was, that's a powerful one. Oh, Thanks. wow. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jack, did you have, did they have a camp in 1946? So in 1946, <clears throat> the property was purchased. I don't think the first uh, summer of camp was till 1947. Okay, um, <clears throat> well, I was there for the first year. 
Okay. Whatever <laughs> year it was. <laughs> it, 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 it was I think it was 40, 1947. Um, okay. That's so you, cool. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you know Carolyn Godfrey? Uh, yes. She that was name married. Is familiar. Yeah. She was married to George Godfrey. He passed away right. uh, just a few months ago. He was a pastor. He was a first paid director, but she was also uh, there that first summer. Her father, mm -hmm. Guy, Guy Leister, was a pastor and was part of the Christian Education Board that purchased the, the camp. Um, <clears throat> they purchased the original 10 acres, which is uh, where the, the Fellowship Hall and the Outdoor Chapel mm -hmm. are uh, for $10,000 back in 1946. Um, <clears throat> and then the, the surrounding 200 and 65 acres, the Laramore Farm was purchased in the mid 50s for $200,000. Right. And, um, most recently, the property was appraised in 2010 for uh, about 13 million. Oh, wow. Well, I can tell you it has certainly changed a lot. Yeah. Since oh, oh yes. I went there. <laughs> yeah, well, kids are different too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, you, you can, if you can imagine, uh, almost all of our programs, we have a couple programs that run in dorms, but almost all of our programs, the kids sleep in cabins that are not air conditioned. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know. That's how, all right. I don't know that many of us could handle that nowadays. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I could. Um, well, I, uh, well, and I were just kind of smiling because he was remembering being on council and ministries. And we think about 25 years ago and they went to Camp Pocomath. The retreat center yeah. was not there. Yeah. He has <laughs> <laughs> That was Many. hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> so he I'll likes the way it looks now. <laughs> it's one of those memories. You know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good kind of tough, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's fun. Yeah, I've done amazing things that I've yes. come with over the years. Well, does anybody else have any more questions or comments? I, uh, I would really like to thank you, Jack, for taking the time. I am just, yes. I was like, you know, you hear an overview of what somebody's going to talk about. And so this sounds nice, but oh my gosh, it's just amazing. <laughs> yeah. Really amazing. It is. It is. Uh, I mean, as Chris will tell you, um, there, there is nothing like being a part of the, the summer camp week. Um, and that's what, uh, my second year in pastoral ministry. I was invited to be a spiritual life coordinator. And um, yeah, I, I just seeing up close what happens with kids spiritually um, and, yeah. and their connection to creation. Um, I, I was sold at that point. And um, that was eight years before I became director. I was, um, you know, I sometimes somewhere along the line, I thought, well, you know, I might like to serve in this ministry. And then <laughs> you know, one day there I was. Yeah. So it's yeah. amazing. Um, I would just like to, to say a little something about the Spain Foundation grants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was working at Neighborhood House when that first came up and we found our first group of Neighborhood House youngsters to go to Camp Pocomath. And when one of the uh, staff went to pick the young people up at the end of their week, they said, oh, no, Miss Cynthia, we still have another half hour. You go away. We're not <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> these, these young people, they, they, they experience things and see things they've never, ever been able to before. And that's, that's why contributions to the Spain grant are so important. Yeah, and if and you're not familiar, um, it'll, we allow, uh, it enables kids who are um, on public assistance or basically a family in need if a pastor or church uh, a, you know says this is a family in need we don't look for any financial form no. anything if somebody mm -hmm. signs a form pastor chris signs a form they get to come for 50 bucks and mm -hmm. the, the, the cheapest camp program is 549 dollars. the most expensive one is 799 so the camp is not cheap but it's totally well, totally funded by donors uh the kids get mm -hmm. to come to camp for the week uh they get a 10 dollar voucher for the um uh, the camp stores, you know, they get a t-shirt when they come. Uh, nobody knows that they're a Spain Grant camper. So right. um, it, they're, they just come to camp just like any other kid. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first year they, they, we have them do Riverside, which is our base camp. But if they return, they can do any camp they want and, and we'll fund it with that, that scholarship. So they mm -hmm. can do that water skiing camp uh, for $800 because we figure if they want to keep coming back, 
Um, yeah. We want them to. We we mm -hmm. we don't care how much it costs. And and you know, typically, uh, you know, we're we're awarding somewhere between you know sixty and seventy thousand dollars a year in in Spain grants to campers. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, the, the other thing is it we like to to use it to help affirm churches who are in ministry with people in need. So, you know, if you're a church and you you have an after school program and you have kids that are in need and you want to send them to camp, you can do that for fifty bucks or. Um, you know, if you're doing ministry with Neighborhood House or uh, mm -hmm. you know, a feeding ministry or, or Urban Promise or, you know, any of these ministries, if you're coming in contact with people in need, this is a way that you can just reinforce the, the ministry right. you're doing to them by saying, hey, would you like your child to be able to come to camp for a week this mm -hmm. summer? And, and for many of them, it's the highlight of their year. Yes. Kathy, if you would read our benediction, then I think we can wrap up. Glad to. Jack, thank you so much. Uh, yes. You have such a positive attitude after the year that we've had. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see and hear all the news. Thank you. Um, may you join me in the benediction. May mm -hmm. the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon us and all our work and worship in his name. May he give us light to guide us, courage to support us, and love to unite us now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. you. Nice to be with you. Bye. 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 Okay.